and it is officially time to start. So welcome guys, welcome. We are live from London. It is 7 p.m. It's 11 of September and uh, uh, 7 p.m. UK time, of course. And uh, before we go anywhere else, just a bit of housekeeping like, as usual. You've got the chat, feel free to use it, ask me any questions. If I've missed anything in the chat, don't get offended. Sometimes it goes a bit too quick for me. And uh, we are in, uh, in Farringdon, in London, and I'm Natalie. Right, let's go. Let's, let me flip this camera around. So we are in front of the beautiful Smithfield Market which is officially no longer a market. Some of you, I think most of you have done that tour before with me in the past. And um, it used to be, of course, for about uh, 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 nine centuries, really, a very busy uh, meat market, a, a wholesaler. But it's officially closed now. And the, the Museum of London is gonna, is gonna come in and, and, and take most of the, most of the building. Welcome, Alice. So, yeah, sadly, the, um, the meat market has moved. It's going to be in Dagenham, I think. It was never a market open at that day time anyway. It was a, a wholesaler, so for, for restaurants and, 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 and businesses to come and get their dead animals at night. <laughs> so they usually, they used to open at midnight, from midnight to about uh, 7 a.m. And uh, of course, it's known for the, uh, for the executions that happened on the other side. But we'll talk about the executions in a little while. For now, let's just have a look at the, the beautiful architecture. And guess what? It is hunted. Apparently, some of the butchers used to, to hear some noises at night, like moaning, like... Ah, ah. We don't know whether it's from the people that have been executed on the other side or from maybe all the animals that have been slaughtered here. Even before to have a meat market, Smoothfield, it was known as Smoothfield, not Smithfield quite yet, it was a place where they sold livestock already. So very, very old uh, place of, um, of trade. We've got some of those beautiful um, fun box. They are listed, so they're part of the, the heritage. We're not allowed to um, remove them. Most of them are no longer in use. Well, some people use them as a public toilet uh, at night, drunken people. But yeah. Sometimes outside of London, they are being equipped with a defibrillator. So if you, um, if you were uh, to spot a, an emergency on the street, you know, someone having a heart attack or anything, you could call the emergency and they could, um, the emergency services could tell you the closest phone box with a defibrillator. So they can now be used to save life. In, uh, in central London, not so many because there's no need, because in central London you have a defibrillator in any train station, any shopping center. Um, so there's no need to equip those um, telephone boxes. And uh, anyway, let me turn around so you have uh, another beautiful view of the market. So the, the, the market itself, the architect is Sir Horace Jones. It's the same gentleman as the, um, uh, that designed uh, the famous Tower Bridge. And on this side of the market here, this is where you'd come if you wanted to sell your wife. Yes, you've heard this right. If you wanted to sell your wife. You'd have to remember that back in the days, getting a divorce was, um, you know, mission impossible. There were only very, very few excuses for which you might be granted a, a divorce or an annulment, as they would have called it originally. Um, one of them was if, you, if your marriage was not consummated. But as you can imagine, that's quite hard to prove. Um, and. Uh, you don't, have a, you don't have a wife to sell. Well, good, good, because at least you don't have to go through this. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, as you can imagine, proving that you, you, your marriage was not consummated, it's, uh, it's a little bit um, awkward. Some people tried, though. Some people did, all across Europe. We call them the impotence trial. So you would literally take your wife to court and you'd have to try to, to perform it in front of, the, of a jury. So, uh, as you can imagine, that's very embarrassing. Sometimes they involved uh, sex workers as well to prove that it was not working. 
Cynthia is asking, did you, could you sell your husband? Well, you know what, Cynthia? Yes. <laughs> I did a bit of research and I did find five cases of husband being sold. But you'd have to remember that in those days, it didn't make much sense to be selling your husband because your husband, he had to provide for you anyway. So if you sold him, you'd be losing money somewhere along the line anyway. But yeah, I did find a few cases. Um, so wife selling, I know it sounds extremely sexist, but really um, most of the time the wife was very much involved. She had to agree to be sold anyway. And, and uh, so it was like an auction. She would go to the highest bidder, but um, very often the highest bidder was already agreed in advance. Uh, uh, and very often it was the secret lover of the, of the lady anyway. You'd, give, you'd have given your husband away. <laughs> well, and, um, and yeah, I, I say it was an auction. It was. I mean, they'll bring their wife with um, some kind of a, a, a harness or a neck collar and they'll be parading the wife. Sometimes they'll bring the kids as well in some kind of a weird package. And then, yes, it was an auction, but uh, the, the wife did not have to go with the highest bidder um, if one gentleman was willing to, willing to pay one pound and, and two shilling and she did not fancy that gentleman, she wanted to go down to the one paying one pound and that's it, uh, she could, she had, to, she had to agree. And it was never fully legal anyway. Uh, most of the time it ended up in court anyway with persecutions, you know. Um, and uh, uh, they did it here or in front of the markets in general because they wanted a large audience, because they wanted witnesses, because, uh, because it was not fully legal, so they had to have some witnesses. And of course the markets were often a busy place. They'd place an ad in the papers just to make sure that they had an audience. And um, you might ask me when did they used to do such thing. It was very British, by the way. The rest of Europe didn't really do it. Actually, the French used to make fun of the Brits for doing such thing. And uh, it started in the, in the 17th century, late 17th century. And the last wife being sold in England, well, you'd be surprised, it was in 1911 in Leeds, in front of the market as well. So not that long ago, really. Beautiful architecture, says Tammy. Yes, so this is a form of monastery. This is the charter house. And, um, well, talking about getting a divorce, you might know one king that, uh, that um, wanted a, a divorce famously, King Henry VIII. Henry wanted to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. They had been together 19 years, but she failed to give him a boy. He really wanted a boy for the, the, the future of his dynasty, you know. And um, yes, 1911, Lauren, yeah, <laughs> that's, I know that's crazy, but yeah. And um, so at the time of Henry VIII, the only person that could rent, grant you a, a, an annulment, really, was the Pope. So Henry, Henry asked the Pope, the Pope said no, because he was a very good friend of the Aragon family in Spain. So Henry was like, stuff it then. I'll break up with the Pope. So he broke up with the Catholic Church to create the, Ch the Church of England, to give himself the, the big job of the head of the church. A nope from the Pope, yes, exactly, Kurt. And um, the, uh, well, as you can imagine, a lot, of the, a lot of the religious people, you know, the monks, the priests, um, they were not exactly very impressed with the king. And apparently the, the, the priest here, the prior at the monastery, um, John Hookton his name was, he refused to swear oath to the king. He refused to kneel in front of the king. And of course that is what we call high treason. Yes. And do you know what we do to the high traitors? They get hanged, drawn and quartered. So you'd be um, dragged behind horses, your head slamming on the pavement, You'd be hanged, but not long enough for you to die. You might know if you were hanged with a short noose, if your neck was not broken, it could take several minutes to kill you. And you'd be struggling for air, you know. You were actually lucky if you had a friend in the audience that could pull your leg to make it a bit quicker. Some believe it might be the origin of the phrase, pulling your leg. And um, 
And then they'll take you down from the scaffold and they'll quarter you. Now, there were two different ways of being quartered. You could either be cut, which was probably the, the nicest way, or you could have one leg attached to one horse, the second leg to a second horse, one arm to a third horse, and the fourth limb to a fourth animal. And, uh, and they'll, take the, they'll tell those four horses to go different directions. So that's how you'd be quartered. And that very priest, he was actually, oh yeah, absolutely barbaric, Janie, yeah. Uh, he was one of the first martyr, martyrs of Henry VIII, really. And uh, would you believe one of his, wo his arm was nailed to that very wall as a deterrent, just to show everyone not to go against the king. So, yeah. And let's turn around so you can see the Charter House Square. So this lovely little square, uh, it's, um, it looks like they had a little exhibition there. Um, it's uh, a lovely little place to come for lunch. You, you sometimes see some, uh, some uh, businessmen having lunch at, at, at their time. But it's hiding a grisly past. Do you know or do you care to guess what happened here? I'm sure a lot of you know because a lot of you have been to that tour before. What happened in that little square? What did it used to be? Exactly, Janie, a plague pit. Um, we did not know for sure until, uh, until a few years ago, really. It had been rumored to have been a plague pit for, 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 for decades, really, or centuries. For the ones that don't know, a plague pit, it's a burial ground that was improvised at the time of the plague. This one is the 14th century plague because, you know, people were dying so quickly that they run out of, 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 of spaces and, 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 and you know, um, uh, place to bury their dead. So they had to be buried very quickly. And um, sometimes you see those documentaries when they kind of put all the bodies on a cart or they just dump them there. No, they would still be buried properly. Like, although they were all together in a pit, they would still be looking up, you know, facing God. They would not just dump them and have them looking down and, you know. And, um, but still quite a, quite a horrible, horrible, you know, horrible way to go. And um, in 2014, we, you know, before that, we didn't quite know for sure. There have been some ghost uh, stories. There have been rumors of, be, of it being a plague pit. At the time, in, um, uh, at some point in the, in the charter house behind me, there was a school and apparently the big kids, they used to grab the little kids and force them to stick their heads to the ground to listen to the voices of the, the people that might have been buried alive. And in 2014, when they started digging for the new uh, the Crossrail project, the new um, Elizabeth line, they, well, they dug 40 meters below here and they did indeed find a lot of bodies. And with modern forensics, you know, they did find traces of the plague bacteria, Yersinia pestis. So it was indeed a plague pit. Charming to eat lunch in a, in a plague pit. Well, you know what, Cynthia, in a lot of places in London where you can have, a, especially in the city, where you can have a bit of a green spot to have a picnic, very often you actually sat on dead people. Uh, most of the time you are, actually. And, um, you know, the, the most um, interesting thing that was found when they dug here, they found two skeletons of male they did not appear to be related. They would have been in nearly 40. And those skeletons, they were holding hands. Now, that's very peculiar. I mean, one might say it might have been a, a, a gay couple and they might have asked to, to, to be buried that way. But to be honest, in, in the 14th century, it's quite unlikely. Or maybe, did, did, did they get buried alive or one of them? And maybe when they, when they realized there was nothing they could do, maybe the last thing they could do was to grab each other's hand. Who knows? We will never know. But being buried alive was a proper phobia 
for many centuries. You know, today, because science has evolved quite dramatically, we're not really scared of that anymore. But for many centuries, people were. And we have found some coffins with scratch marks inside. So we know it has happened. And um, actually, it was such a fear that in Victorian times, they had um, uh, invented a, a, a system with a, a rope so if you woke up, if you had money, of course, if you woke up in your coffin, um, you could pull the rope and that would be pulling uh, the bell to ring the bell. Some believe that might be the, uh, the, origin, of, the origin of the phrase, the phrase dead ringer. Who knows? And some say that it might also be the origin of saved by the bell. But um, personally, I doubt it because in French, saved by the bell, it is saved by the gong. So I suppose it refers to the boxing matches. But who knows, who knows. And uh, we're now arriving at the new, uh, the new Farringdon station on the Elizabeth line. So that's the new uh, um, tube line. It's not really a tube, it's like a train uh, that opened uh, a couple of years ago now. And uh, so we've got two Farringdon station. This one, as far as I know, is not hunted yet. Um, the other one is. The other one, uh, the other Farringdon station, it's hunted by the ghost of a little girl. Um, her name was Anne Naylor. She was 13 years old when, when she died. She had been killed. Or, probably manslaughter, it probably was accidental, but she had been killed by the, 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 the lady for, for who she worked and dismembered. And then um, the, the, the lady uh, decided to dispose of the body on the site that is now the New Farringdon station. And would you believe when, the, the, when the, the, those body parts were found, the coroner decided not to investigate because he believed it was the leftovers from the body snatchers or from the anatomy after the body was stolen. So for the ones that don't know, the body snatchers, they were those people stealing the newly buried bodies to sell them, thank you, thank you, to sell them to the anatomist. At the time, there was a massive demand for, for human bodies because the only bodies that were given to science for, the, for the, 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 the dissections, that was the bodies from the criminals, from the hangings. So they were not enough, especially not enough kids, because of course they were rarely hanged. And um, so the coroner believed, we're quite close to, uh, to St. Bart's Hospital, so the coroner believed that it might have been the anatomist that dissected a stolen body and then dis disposed of it disposed of it. So that's how it's only much later that they found out that little Anne had been um, killed. And uh, talking about body snatchers, I'm sure some of you have been to Edinburgh in person or virtually you might have gone with Sam. Uh, she's here in the chat today. So you might have heard of Burke on Hare. They're probably the most famous body snatchers ever. Although Burke on Hare were not body snatchers. They've never snatched a body in their life. You know, the fresher the bodies, the better they would sell for a lot of money. And Burke on Hair, well, they decided to, to get the, the freshest body ever. They decided to kill. So they were killing their victims to then sell them to the anatomist in Scotland, in Edinburgh. They got caught, but they inspired some London body snatchers. They called themselves, the, they were called the London Burkers. And there was a gang that operated around here. And um, they, um, they, uh, they were uh, finding victims in pubs, victims that might be a little bit drunk. And then they would get them even drunker. And then they'll take them home and they'll drown them. At the time, drowning was not leaving enough marks on the body to be spotted. Today we'll spot it straight away. Today you'd, you'd see, the, you'd see the, the water in the lumps very quickly, but at the time they didn't know. And this very pub, the Rising Sun, apparently that's one of the places where they targeted their victims. So at the time it would have been a very dangerous place to drink. Today it's an absolutely lovely pub. So if you are in the area, it's a, it's a cool one. <laughs> and um, so yeah, th those London burkers, 
they got caught um, because of the case of the Italian boy. Um, he's, uh, uh, he, uh, he was a young, uh, a young teenage boy that was sold to Guy's Hospital. And they used to, um, well, they used to remove the, the teeth to sell them to the dentist because they could make dentures with them. So before to sell the bodies to the, to the anatomist, they would cut the hair to sell the hair to the hairdressers and they used to remove the teeth. Now, if you remove the teeth from a cadaver that has been buried for three days, it doesn't bleed. If you remove the teeth from a cadaver that has just been killed, then you end up with blood in the mouth. So that's how at Guy's Hospital, they got the, they got, um, they got the little Carlo Ferrari and um, well, he had some blood in his, uh, in his, um, in his mouth. So they very quickly became suspicious. He didn't look like he had been buried at all. And they told, uh, they told uh, the London workers, OK, we'll, we'll go and fetch the money. And they've actually gone to fetch a police officer. So that's how they got arrested. And they were hanged. I'll show you at the end of the tour where they were hanged. And um, well, because they were criminals, they were hanged. And of course, well, they were dissected because that's what happened to the criminals. Anyway, beautiful church here. It is uh, Saint Bartholomew the Great. It's one of the oldest church, uh, churches in the city of London, 1123. And uh, well, this tour is called London Way of Death. But for a moment, I'd like to, I'd like to tell you about the Victorian Way of Death. It's, um, I don't want to say that grieving was any easier then, because it probably wasn't, but it was much more often you know, very often you'd have, um, hi Catherine, you'd have a family or you'd have a mother that might have 12 kids and she might lose, let's say, um, let's say, you know, five out of typhus, cholera, tuberculosis, um, you name it, you know, any of those horrible diseases. So it's not that grieving was any easier, but it would have, it would happen quite, quite often, sadly. And, um, those Victorians, they had some interesting rituals. They would keep the dead in the front room, the room that today we call the living room or the lounge. Well, would you believe at the time they used to refer to that room as the death room? Because, well, that's where they kept the dead. Oh, you've lost one, Lauren. Oh, sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, so that's where they'll keep, uh, they'll keep the, the, the dead and they'll come and visit, they'll stay with the dead. Um, they, they, for them, their last words were very important. They wanted to make sure they catch that. They used to often uh, flip the family photos around um, to make sure somehow the spirit of the dead would not um, come into the, the, the living. And uh, they'll bake some funeral biscuits, if they had money. Of course, if they were poor, it was a different, uh, different story. And uh, they'll send those biscuits with the, the invites for, the, for the, the funerals. Where is this? We are in, uh, in, uh, in the city of London. We are by Farringdon Station, uh, Catherine. And again, if you had money, the day of the funeral, so you dress in black, of course. Um, uh, uh, well, it's, it's really Queen Victoria that started the fashion of, of dressing in black because she was mourning her husband for four for years. Um, a lady would have to, if a lady was burying her husband, she would have to dress in black for two years. If it was the other way around, if it was a gentleman burying his wife, two weeks. Not fair. And, uh, and yeah, the day of the funerals, they'll, um, if they have money, <laughs> Yeah, I know everyone makes fun of me when I say biscuits. <laughs> it's actually a French word, biscuit, cuit, cuit, cooked, so cooked twice. So I should be able to pronounce it properly, right? Obviously not. <laughs> anyway, the, um, the, if they had money, they would hire some professional mourners. So those were ladies that were, um, that were paid to follow the coffin and cry and cry and cry for a dead that they had never met. And the very sad thing is that often those ladies, those professional mourners or weepers, they were actually working hand in hand with the, uh, with the body snatchers. 
they would pretend to cry at the, at the, the ceremony, but then they were passing on the information the age of the disease, the location of the grave, to the body snatchers, so later on their, their cadavers could be stolen and sold. And um, again, if you had money, um, you might, before the funeral, you might do a post-mortem photography. Now, if you are a bit sensitive, close your eyes for a second, because I'm about to show you photographs of people that are dead. Um, when I say, I know when I say post postmortem photography, it might seem extremely weird because for us today, it's really weird because, you know, if I was to die tomorrow, you'd have hundreds of photos of me on my Facebook or you probably would have hundreds of screenshots of me anyway. But um, at, the, uh, the, the, um, at the time, you know, people did not have that many photographs. It was, it was very expensive. So you'd have maybe one family photo, you know, or maybe one photo before to get married, maybe one family photo 10 years later. So if really you lost one of your little ones, you probably would have no photos at all. So it would kind of make sense to take one before to bury them. So let me show you a few examples. On the right hand side, so that's quite a classic one, the little girl posing with all her dolls. And the left inside, that's interesting. Very often, the dead would actually have their eyes closed on the photograph. But what they used to do, they would develop the photo, and on the developed photograph, they used to paint the eyes open. Sometimes it looked very good, sometimes it looked a little bit creepy. And um, so that's, that's the case here on the left inside. Hi, Queen. Hi, Bianca. Welcome, guys. Let me show you some more. So here on the left, on the uh, right hand side, it's quite a classic one. You can clearly see the gentleman is, is dead. Uh, he's got his... Um... Oh, you took a few photos yourself, Julie. Oh, interesting. And um, on the right hand side, that's when it gets interesting. You'd have to remember that at the time, um, photography was a very long exposure. So you'd have to stay still for a minute or so. So you can see the parents here, they're a bit blurred because they're moving, they're breathing. The girl in the middle, she's very much in focus because she's dead. Let me show you one more. Just so you know, I've chosen to show you photographs that have been published by the BBC because usually it's quite a relevant f source of information. According to that BBC journalist, the little girl on the left here, she's actually passed. She's being held with some kind of metal, metal uh, holder at the back. Now, I have my doubts. Let me show you my face for a sec. Um, I know that sometimes after my tours, people like to do a bit more research, you know. If you end up looking at mo mo morto, Momento Mori, as they called it, or Victorian post-mortem photography, be very careful what you look at on the internet, because there's a lot of fake. There's a lot of um, journalists or wannabe journalists or, or YouTubers that would take any Victorian photo and they'll tell you, yeah, this one is a standing corpse. This one is dead as well. And sometimes, to be fair, you can see some kind of metal hooks behind their, behind their backs. But that's, again, because it was a long, um, a long exposure. So even when you were very much alive, it helped to have you stable and, 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 and still. If you ask a mortician, there's actually a YouTuber. She's called Ask a Mortician. She's amazing. Well, my f one of my friends is a big fan of hers. Um, if you ask a mortician, it's... Um, it's really hard to stand a corpse. So, um, yeah, be careful what you look at on the internet. Hi, Natalie. Hey, so let's go down. I'll show you a little interesting thing here by the, um, by the entrance. So if you look at the entrance of the church here, San Bartolomeo the Great, you can see the level of the floor is much lower than the level of the graveyard where we were a minute ago at least a meter and 30 centimeters. Do we know why? I'm sure some of you know why. Why is the level of the ground much lower than the level of the graveyard? Any guesses? Exactly, too many bodies. 
we had uh, through the 19th century we had a lot of dead in London the population of London had doubled because of the between the year 1800 to 1850 the population of London had doubled because of the industrial revolution um, you know a lot of people moved into the city so there was hardly enough space for the living let alone the dead so some of those 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 uh, people burying people were actually charlatan they would sell you a grave but a few months later they'll they'll open it and cut you and, and you know make some space and um, the, the, the the grave diggers they were paid by the foot the deeper the better and uh, um, well, they were stacking up so many bodies that it was actually very unhealthy. Because even for the grave digger themselves, you know, to go and cut a body two months later, they could catch typhus, uh, cholera, uh, tuberculosis, you name it. And also, sorry, this is a bit gross, but you know, dead bodies, when they decompose, they kind of create a bit of uh, juices, you know. Well, ju those juices used to seep into the ground, into the water sources that we used to drink. Uh, Lauren, we don't know exactly how many bodies. Um, it's, um, uh, it's, it's hard to tell, but there would, they, they, they literally are thousands, thousands in, in, in there, because they would make space, you know, once uh, one is, is gone. Um, yeah, those, those juices would end up in the water sources. We had a few cases of water pumped uh, being uh, contaminated by, by uh, graveyards. So it was getting a bit too much. And in 1852, they created the, what they called the Burial Act. So you were not allowed to be buried in the, uh, in the, um, in the, in the city center anymore. So that's how they created the Magnificent Seven. So that's those... Um, those uh, 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 amazing garden cemeteries that were built on the outskirts of, of London or what was the outskirts at the time. So we're talking uh, uh, Kensal Green, um, Tower Hamlet, Nunhead, West Norwood, Brompton. Um, a lot of those I actually covered in some of my tours. And people were scared, you know, they didn't want to go and be buried so far away from their local parish uh, churches. Um, they just didn't want to go. Uh, so they needed influencers. The, influ the influencers at the time, you know, it was the royals. So the first royal to go and be buried in one of those garden cemetery, that was the Duke of Sussex, the, the son of George III. He went to uh, uh, Kensal Green and then his little sister Sophia followed. And then uh, you had Jon Snow in Brompton and, and you know, Jon Snow, not you know, John Snow, the, the epidemiologist, not the John Snow uh, that you might have in mind. And um, we are now on the other side of the beautiful Smithfield Market. So you might remember what we used to do on this site. It was the executions. So there were different types of, of public executions, depending on your crime. If you were a bit of a VIP, you might be beheaded. That was a nice way to go. If you were uh, 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 a petty criminal, criminal or uh, normal crimes, you might be hanged. If you were an heretic, so if your crime was about religion, you might be burned. And if you happen to be burned alive, most of the time they were actually killed before, but if you are burned alive, you might, you might want to know that in, in England it was horrible. You know, in Spain, through the Spanish Inquisition, for example, because of the atmosphere being quite dry, you'd actually die, you'd die quite quickly. In the UK, because of the humidity, it could take ages for you to die. So it was really a, a horrible, horrible way to go. And the most famous person being, um, being executed here, uh, you might have heard of him, it is William Wallace. You might have heard of him under the name, uh, well, Mel Gibson with a wig, if you've watched uh, uh, Braveheart in the, in the 90s. And he was hanged, drawn and quartered. Yes, some people were boiled. Well, according to some, uh, some said that uh, Bloody Mary, she even fried some protestant. But I don't think there's any evidence of that. Some said that she, uh, she got some, like, meat um, fat from the meat market and she fried a few protestants 
but that might be a bit uh, uh, exaggerated. Um, anyway, William Wallace, um, he was, uh, we, let's not go into details into why he was uh, executed because we've got a few Scottish people in the crown tonight uh, and we've got a slightly different version of history between Scotland and England. But um, let's say that for the English he was a high traitor, uh, for the Scots he was, uh, he was a raw hero. So he was, um, he, he was dragged behind horses until here. Um, when he got here, they would have chopped out his, his manhood, his, uh, his willy. That was to uh, signify that you were not worthy of any descendant. Then he was, um, he was hanged, but not long enough for him to die. And then he was, uh, he was gutted. So they, they cut his belly open, they removed his guts, they burned his guts in front of him. So if he was still alive for a few seconds, he would have been able to smell his own guts burning. And then he was quartered. And then part of his body were, were dispatched around the country. Um, yes, this is lo the location where it happened, Lauren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his head would have been placed on, on a spike at the top of the, uh, on the, on the London Bridge. And uh, that was for gentlemen, by the way. They did not do that to ladies for public decency or maybe because they were worried that some people might somehow find it uh, uh, exciting. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was for, for gentlemen. Ladies would not, uh, would not have that fate. Um, anyway, we are now in front of St. Bart's Hospital. And um, the Victorian ghost photography is weird too. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, a, a lot of them are fake as well, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, up there, this is King Henry VIII. Henry VIII, I'm sure you know him because of his six wives and for beheading two of them. Little less known fact about Henry, he was the first monarch to give four bodies a year to science, four bodies for the executions. Um, before that, the bodies were sacred. We, you know, we didn't touch them really. And uh, Henry decided that four of the criminals would be given to, uh, to, those, uh, to those dissections. It was far from enough, but that was already a start. And, uh, you know, at the time it would make sense to give the bodies of the criminals because at the time they believed that if you were not buried properly, you would not be able to reach heaven. So it made sense to give the bodies of the criminals because, of course, well, they were not going to go to heaven, you know, because they were criminals. You don't want to look up his skirt. <laughs> well, Lauren, uh, if you trust his armor, you know, in the Tower of London, uh, he had a massive thing to, to he had a massive thing ar uh, around, uh, around that area of his body. Uh, but that's probably psychological warfare. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about, but if you've been to the Tower of London, you would have seen the armor from King Henry VIII. And that little, that part is massively exaggerated. If you've not seen it, Google it. I'm sure there are, there are some photos on the internet. <laughs> anyway, let's go on and, uh, and see the, the, uh, a little street with an interesting ghost. It is the scratching fanny of uh, Cock Lane. Oh, we were just talking about that. Uh, we've, we've got a dirty team tonight or what? Uh, so the, the, the scratching fanny of Cock Lane, it's not what you think. I know it sounds very funny, on both sides of the Atlantic, um, the, uh, uh, in, in, in British English, when we say fanny, it's, it's the female genitalia, basically. Um, but back in the 18th century, it was quite a popular name. It still is a popular name in France today, so I'm quite lucky I'm not called fanny. And I know if you're from the other side of the pond, you might call the bum fanny. But if you have a scratchy bum on Cock Lane, it's also quite funny. Um, Anyway, it's not what you think. But before I tell you the story, let me show you the, um, the golden boy of Pie Corner up there. So this is the very spot where the Great Fire of London finished in uh, 1666. With the Great Fire of London, they blamed gluttony. You know, at the time, people did not believe that any, um, any tragedy could happen for no reason. They blamed themselves. They believed it was a punishment for, for, from God. And because um, 
it started at Pudding Lane and it finished at Pie Corner, they believed they were punished for gluttony. That's why the golden boy used to be called the fat boy of Pie Corner, but we changed the name because of um, politi political correctness, really. And at the time, it was not on this building, it was on a pub, the Fortune of War. Remember that name because we'll talk about the pub in a second. But let me tell you the story of the scratching Fanny of Cock Lane. So Fanny and William, they were a couple uh, that moved into a lodging house here. Hi, Kevin, welcome. And they were, um, they were uh, uh, an interesting couple because they used to, well, William used to be married to Fanny's sister. And when she passed, he married, he married Fanny instead. So Fanny was really scared that one day the ghost of her sister might come back to her and be like, hey, what are you doing with my husband? So Fanny was always scared of ghosts. And they moved into a lodging house right here. A lodging house was like a hotel, but you could stay long term. And you know what? They, well, first there was an altercation between the boys, between the landlord, Richard, so we've got Richard, you know, the nickname for Richard is Dick. So we've got Dick, Willie and Fanny. So it's, it cannot be a boring story, you know. And um, the, um, the lodging house would have been around here where the, the building stands today. And um, he, uh, uh, um, the landlord, Richard, he borrowed some money from William and he never gave it back. So eventually William had to start legal actions against his landlord. And, um, and uh, uh, then Fanny started to hear a ghost. She could hear a ghost. She could hear some scratching noises. And Elizabeth, she was a teenage girl. She was the daughter of the landlord, Richard. She could also hear the ghost. And one day Fanny died quite suddenly. She died out of smallpox. And, and, uh, and apparently the ghost of Fanny came back to the little Elizabeth and she said to her that she did not die out of smallpox. She had been poisoned with arsenic by her very lover, William. Now, because that was a murder accusation, they had to investigate. And everyone wanted to come here. Everyone wanted to come and spend the night at the lodging house to see if they could hear the scratching fanny of Cock Lane. So the landlord, Dick, he made, uh, he made a lot of money. And uh, I've got to be careful with what I say because YouTube kind of, uh, it has a robot that uh, uh, notice the dirty terms. So I might, might get demonetized. Anyway, uh, so the landlord, uh, uh, Richard, he actually made a lot of money um, with, um, with, uh, uh, with the, 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 the ghost. And eventually it came out that it was all a fraud. It was the, the, the little Elizabeth, she had been hiding under the furniture and scratching the walls. So she was a fake ghost. And uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, um, the, the landlord had to spend a bit of time in prison for the, for the, the, the fraud. If you're wondering what time, I didn't even tell you what type of uh, timing. It's 1762, the, the scratching fanny of Cock Lane. And um, so yeah. Sadly, it's not a real ghost, but don't worry. I'm now taking you to a place with some real ghost, if you believe. But for now, let's take a look at the building to my right. This is still St. Bart's Hospital. So that's a place where they did a lot of dissections. And um, across the street here, see the little building in the middle? It's a replica, it's not the original. The original was destroyed, I believe, through the Second World War. But it's a watch house. So you had someone at the top watching out. What, the, what were they watching for? What, uh, I'll give you a clue, there's a, a graveyard at the back. That's the church where um, uh, John Smith was buried, you know, the John Smith from uh, Pocahontas. Exactly, body snatchers. So the, um, they'll be watching out from, for, for the, they'll, they'll be doing graveyard shift. Some say that's uh, the original of the phrase. Uh, yes, exactly, Lauren, grave robbers. Because, well, of course, we've got the graveyard at the back, but 
Remember, I, I mentioned that a naughty pub, the Fortune of War, where the golden boy of Pike Corner used to stand there. Well, apparently in that pub upstairs, they had a room where they had some benches and they used to lay down the corpse that had been stolen. So the anatomist, all they had to do was to cross over the street, look at the corpse, check the, the state, you know, if they were not too rotten, if they were pregnant ladies or kids, they would be even more valuable. And then they'll buy them and then they'll have to find a way to cross the street again. Now, they'll have to transport those bodies in... Um, in, uh, well, you could live here, Tish. It's actually, uh, it's actually uh, uh, an accommodation now. There's one somewhere in England. Where is it? In the, in the Midlands, I think. There's one that does Airbnb now, uh, a watch house. I don't remember where it is, but I think it's in the Midlands or something. So if you come to visit, you can, uh, you can stay in there. And uh, yeah, so the, uh, the anatomists, they would carry the bodies and cross the street and that was it. Often, the, the, the night watch, they would they'll take a little bribe and they'll, uh, they'll kind of pretend that they've not seen anything because it, it was not well paid. And would you believe stealing a body was not actually completely illegal because those bodies didn't really belong to anybody. So they usually, they usually dug at the top of the grave, they'll break the top of the coffin, they'll put some uh, ropes around the corpse's um, arms, they'll drag them out, but then they'll, um, they'll strip the, the body naked because if they stole an item of clothing, it was a different punishment because that would have been robbery. Um, so yeah. And let me show you a beautiful pub here. So this is the Viaduct Tavern. And guess what? It is hunted. We have a lot of pubs in London that claim to be hunted, but this is probably one of the, one of the worst ones. Well, if you followed my Jack the Ripper tour, you might know that I believe the Ten Bells, it's probably the most hunted pub. But this one is probably the, uh, uh, one of the top ones as well. They have a cellar that some people claim was a prison cell from the prison next door. Apparently, it's very much debatable. Some historians completely deny that. But the, the cellar is very, very creepy. And... Um, there have been a lot of ghost claims, um, especially in the, uh, in the late 80s. We had uh, one of the landlords, he went down to get some beer in the, in the cellar because a lot of the staff apparently they don't want to go down there, they're scared. And apparently the door closed behind him, it went like... Yeah. And then he heard a voice that said, it's only the two of us down here now. <laughs> Um, they have sent quite a few um, investigators, you know, paranormal investigators and people recording the sounds. And to be fair, they did record some form of sound, but there's also a, a, an, under, um, an, order, an under, underground water stream that, um, that runs under the, under the building, so that could be the water they've recorded. Who knows? Anyway, let me cross over. I shouldn't go now, but let's... Yes, let's do this. And um, spirits are in the house, yes. And not only gin. Because this used to be a gin palace. So, um, if you've been to London before, you might have noticed we do drink a lot of gin in London. To tell you a bit more about the history of, of gin, um, in the late 1600s, very late 1600s, we had a king, William of Orange, from, from the Netherlands. He was, of course, a Protestant king. He, um, well, he, he placed a tax on all the goods coming from the Catholic countries. So, so bye-bye, uh, bye-bye French brandy or French wine. Hello, gin. Gin was a good Protestant drink because, of course, it was from the Netherlands. And there was no tax on gin. Anyone could brew it at home. Yes, exactly, Moser's Ruin. And, uh, and it became the drink of the poor. And a lot of ladies, a lot of poor ladies were completely addicted to gin. One of the worst cases was the case of Judith Dufour. Judith Dufour, she has a French name because she was the daughter of a Huguenot weaver. She, um, she was uh, sadly addicted to gin and she had a, a, a son that she had given to, um, 
into a, 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 an orphanage, like the, the forerunner of the workhouses. And one day she was drinking with her mate, she ran out of money for gin. So she went back to the orphanage to, to get back her toddler, two years old. The orphanage had given the little girl a new petticoat and a little jacket. What she did next was horrifying. She, she got her baby back. She strangled her own baby. She ditched the little one in a ditch, but first she stripped the baby naked to sell those items of clothing from the, from the orphanage for 16 pence. We're talking less than $30 in today's money to buy more gin. Yeah, horrible. Uh, you'd be lucky to, 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 you'd be happy to know that she was caught and she was hanged. Yeah, evil, uh, yeah. Uh, and um, uh, uh, yeah, so when you, you know, when we say mother's ruin, you know, that's this type of cases that really um, gave, uh, gave birth to the, uh, the expression. And talking about killing little ones, um, this is the Old Bailey. So it, they have trialed some of the worst criminals in history. And one of, I mean, the worst Victorian criminal, according to me, she was trialed here. It is Amelia Dyer. Amelia, she was, um, maybe one day I should take you to Reading and do a tour on Amelia Dyer. Um, she was a baby farmer. The, uh, the, the, the baby farmers, they were those, um, uh, uh, those ladies to, it was a trade that was, um, I mean, some of them were honest. You know, at the time, you know, if you, if you got pregnant um, out of wedlocks, um, all your prospect of life and career and, and marriage would just go away from you. Suddenly you'd be a fallen lady, or, or, you know. So the solution for them was often to, 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 to give their babies away or to sell them um, to, 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 uh, to adoptions, really. Um, well, sell them, no, they'll pay, they'll pay to give them away. And they'll pay those, uh, those baby farmers. The baby farmers, they used to um, take the babies away and, and officially they were meant to give them for adoption into, into farms or family that needed a bit more workers because often those poor kids were working really hard in, in the farms. And some of those baby farmers were honest but the trade was terribly regulated and there were a lot of very dodgy ones. Well, Amelia Dyer was one of them. She started to kill the babies instead. And uh, she got caught eventually but um, we don't know how many. Some believe, uh, well, it could be anywhere from m maybe 50 to 400. I mean, we, we just don't know. Um, but yeah, one of the, probably the worst serial killer in, in Victorian history. So she, she's meant to be hunting the building as well. Apparently when she, was, uh, when she was executed, she told the executionist, I'll be back. And one day he saw her face again um, when, the, when the, the building was destroyed. Anyway, it's going to be the end of the tour, but one last little story before we go. This is, of course, the Old Bailey today, but it was for about seven, seven centuries. One of the main uh, prisons in London, it was the, um, the site of Newgate prison. And the criminals would often leave Newgate to be, uh, to be executed at the Tyburn. The Tyburn was at the site of Marble Arch today. So the prisoners would be taken on a cart, They'll be going down the street here, then down this street here, all the way to, uh, through uh, Oxford Street. At the time, they used to refer to it as Tyburn Road. And um, they'll stop in a pub for a last, a last drink, a last one for the road, if you've heard the expression, that was the road to the Tyburn. And uh, the prisoners would often say, oh yeah, I'll get you one on the way back. Of course, there was no way back. The driver, the coachman, he was not drinking because he was on a wagon. So you might have heard the expression to be on a wagon. We can tell from the, the number of expression that comes from those executions, how casual they were about the executions. And of course, when they got there to the Tyburn, it was a proper party, you know, um, a, a, a bit like a festival today with a lot of alcohol. And, um, and again, the, the Oh, thank you, Lauren. Thanks to anyone that sent me a little tip. That's very much uh, appreciated. And, um, well, I might have told you in some of my other tours, but some believe that the day after the executions, 
Some people woke up feeling a bit dry, you know, a bit hangover, literally the day after the hangings. That's why it's, that's what, that one is very much debatable, but that could also be where the execution came from. And uh, the expression uh, came from, I meant. And the streets here would have been very busy. The, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the people would stand here and throw feces at the criminals or blow kisses at them, depending on the crime. And eventually they stopped those execution at the Tyburn. Um, thank you, Jenny. Thanks everyone that left me a little tip again. Uh, even if I don't see them live on here, uh, thank you very much if you've given me anything on buy me a coffee or, or PayPal. And uh, the, um, some people were completely against those public ex execution. They, they believed it brought no good to society. And to try to quiet them down a bit, instead of doing it at the Tyburn, they started to do it right here, where the fountain stands today. And they started to do it at 8 a.m. in the morning, instead, instead of uh, uh, later on through the day. So they were hoping to have less people. That did not really work. People would come the night before to have the best view on those executions. The, uh, to give you an idea, we were talking about the London Burkers earlier. Well, when they were executed here, there was an audience of 30,000, we believe. So that's, uh, that's crazy. Thank you, Cheryl. And the pub here, the Magpie, it would have been a very different pub at the time, of course. But they had a little balcony, and apparently they used to do an execution breakfast. So you could come at the balcony and pay for a, a full English or, or whatever you wanted, and then you'd have the very best view on the, uh, on the executions. And that stopped, of course, in 1868. Um, some people, including Charles Dickens, were completely against it. You know, they believed it was such bad taste and it brought no good to, um, to society, really. Anyway, it's going to be the end of the tour. Let me show you my face again and let me know if you have any questions before I go. So thank you very much for coming today. If, you've, um, if you were completely new to me and if you've, uh, you've enjoyed that little tour, I do quite a lot of I do quite a lot of those, so if you want to make sure you don't miss out on the next ones, you might want to give me a, a subscribe. Uh, it doesn't cost anything, of course, and then you can, um, you'd, be the, um, you'd be more likely to, to know about uh, the next tours. And uh, if any of you gave me a little tip, it's greatly appreciated. Um, that's um, pretty much all the money we get. I mean, there's a, a, a tiny, tiny little bit of income due to the ads, but with my, my numbers at the moment, it's, uh, it's very, very low. So I very much fully um, uh, rely on your tips. How many, uh, how many? Oh, uh, Lauren, I think today it's, it can still be about, uh, about 10. Uh, you can still qu fit quite a few people in, in graves today, but uh, we, don't have, we don't have that much burials anymore. It's about, I think it's between 15 to 20 percent of the population that, that is actually buried. So we have much more cremations today. The proportion is still st slightly different in the Catholic countries. Uh, so in Spain, in France, you might have many more burials, but in, uh, in, in England, it's, uh, it's not that often. Yeah, I, I think you can still do 10. Well, those, you know, some of those graves are still being reused today. Even in those Victorian cemeteries, if you, if you can prove that the plot used to belong to your family, you can still be buried there. Oh yes, you can uh, you can drop me a tip with the dollar sign. Yes, so um, so yes, that's uh, that. Sorry, it's a bit noisy here. It's a bit. Uh, it's easier. It's. Uh, or you can also use buy me a coffee or PayPal. I'll um, I'll have a little less commission on, on buy me a coffee or PayPal, but whatever is uh, is more convenient for you, uh, uh, anything is uh, is very much appreciated. Anyway, if you wanted to see a bit more of me, next Monday we, we've got an, 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 a Monopoly one again. We're going to Vine Street. 
Vine Street is one of the most obscure uh, Monopoly locations. But yeah, so that's next Monday, I think about 9 p.m. if I remember right. Next Monday evening, anyway. Cool. Thank you guys for coming today. Have a good evening, a good morning, whatever time it is for you, wherever you are in the world. And uh, I'll see you soon. Bye bye.